Hello everybody, we're back again. And this video today is gonna be absolutely, absolutely crazy. Let me explain. Today I have a talk in the morning, I have meetings throughout the day, and I have three podcast episodes with Frank Lampard, Rita Ora, and Will I Am. And then tonight I have an event we're doing with Simon Sinek with 3,000 people coming. And then tomorrow, I'm flying out to Turkey to spend some time with the British Red Cross in the wake of the natural disaster, the earthquake that happened, which I think is the biggest earthquake that's ever hit the European continent, or at least in a couple of decades. That's gonna be, it's hard to find the words, right? It's gonna be difficult to see. And I guess that's a warning because I'm sure some of the things that you're gonna see if you stay tuned to this vlog, specifically at the end of the vlog, might be quite hard to take. But right now I have to go and get in the car and make my way to this MailChimp. That's my manager calling. This is MailChimp. I feel like I've been away from work and life for so long. Yeah, it's been, um, it's so it's weird. been interesting. <laughs> Just feels like I've been everything, every yeah. company. Like I'm, Everyone's I'm, probably asking you everything. Hey, yeah. Hello. Hello. It's Siobhan. Yeah. How you doing? Hello. Nice to meet you. How are you? Hello. Let's get you in. Cool. Hello, are you right? Makeup. How am I looking? I tell you, oh, totally thank you. You're different so sweet. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's> so sweet. <laughs> I spend all week in, in makeup and I almost forget that I'm just covered. So, you know, then I'll like, go, go for a IV run and, and I'll, makeup. yeah, I go for a run after and I go, oh my God, because they literally have like a spray gun. Have oh, you seen those oh, spray yeah, guns? Yeah, yeah. Spray, yeah. It really does make Where you, do you feel, that? when I get to Dragon's Den at Manchester, yeah. She get, they get it and it's like, yeah, close your eyes. <laughs> I look in the mirror and I look. Yeah. Are you enjoying Dragon's Den? Yeah, I love it. I really, really love it. It's um, it's a lot of. It's, it sounds a bit privileged to say it's a lot of work when I just sit in a chair, but it's like wake up at seven. I get back to the hotel at midnight. Yeah. So. It's their long day. Really long day. It is. We usually get like one or two days off a week when I'm in the Dragon's Den filming stage. Okay. So when we have those days off, it's it's great to do a variety of things. Yeah. Hello. Hi. You're right. Hi. Michelle. How are you? Priya, sorry, nice to meet you, Priya. Trouble. I just called We've just... my kids and I said, say, because they watch Dragons. Oh, really? And I said, can you just tell me about Stephen Barton? He's about <laughs> to go on stage. And my niece said, he's one of the good dragons. Oh, that's so and nice. She wants you to send her oh, really? a message. Perhaps um, I'll send her a video. All right, so I've got a little surprise for the kids. Hi, kids. I heard one of you describe me as the good dragon, which I'm very um, humbled by. That was Ava. By. Ava. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for, for tuning in and watching Dragon's Den. And I also agree, I think I am a, a good dragon. Um, there are bad dragons as well, that like Peter Jones, he's a bad dragon, he, isn't he? He's that? a really bad dragon. Tuka Solomon, that's a bad dragon. Uh, no, I'm joking. We all get on like a house on fire and um, hopefully, if, you, if you're watching Dragon's Den and you're what, 13 years old? Mm -hmm. 11 and 13. 11, 13 years old. Well, when I was 13 years old, I started watching Dragon's Den because that's when it aired. I think it was 12 when the first season aired. And as I watched the show, I used to imagine myself as a dragon. And so 12 was the age I was introduced to Dragon's Den and 20... 7, 28 was the day the age I became a dragon. So you've got about 15 years, kids, um, and then you're all going to be dragons. So work hard, believe in yourself, and one day I'll see you in the den sat alongside me. Brilliant. Thank you. Lots of love, good dragon. Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> so, cool. so great to have you here with us. Amazing to be here. Amazing. It's a, it's a vibe in here, isn't it? Shout out to the DJ. What a song. <laughs> feeling, feeling. Stephen, what would be your top three ways to promote a podcast ever? Ooh, what a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> Interestingly. Um, number one is have a great guest. That if, if you want reach, then you're essentially leveraging their audience. So if you have Molly May on your podcast, um, then you're leveraging Molly May's audience. So guests that have an existing audience. Um, the next one, most important, is to video it. The reason why podcasts really do need to be videoed is because to get organic growth on the podcast store is incredibly difficult because there's no social graph underneath there. There isn't a social network underneath Spotify. So 50% of podcast growth comes from word of mouth. And that's digital word of mouth, sending it to a friend in WhatsApp or 
in the back of a cab with your friend. So if you have clips of it, you then do get the, the social sharing because it spreads across LinkedIn and Twitter and TikTok, etc. And then YouTube is another one. By videoing it, you put it on YouTube where there is a billion people and Google underneath there that will, will do organic. And number three, most important thing is try and make great content that's valuable. Um, that that's the long-term play, make stuff that's valuable to people. And that's definitely the most difficult thing. But if you can't get big influencers on your podcast, you want to start a podcast that's like, um, we did it for Hinge. We launched their podcast and we called it Ghost Stories. Very simple concept, but it's inherently word of mouth compelling. We invite someone on that got ghosted on a dating app. They say what happened, how they got ghosted. Five minutes later, the curtain drops and the person that ghosted them walks in. See the reaction there? Inherently word of mouth compelling and simple to explain to a friend in the back of a cab, right? Interview people who are currently cheating on their partner. Ask them how they're doing it and why they're doing it. You're laughing again, inherently word of mouth compelling. You're gonna tell your friend in the back of a cab. Interview someone the day before they die. Inherently word of mouth compelling and will be driven by digital, PR, and word of mouth. That, can, that will be the growth engine. What I wouldn't do if I didn't have a big audience outside of podcasting and I couldn't get access to big people, if I wanted to get big, I wouldn't in just interview someone because you don't have an advantage there. What I'm saying is creativity in the concept can be your advantage. That's open for all of us. That's a war we can all fight. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're very patient. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. I'm the DJ. Thank you so much. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. I'm so annoyed you played that song. I thought it was my secret. No, I really <laughs> sat down for a break and you said, no, no, you just said your name. Yeah. And I was like, no. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Thank well you. done. Well done. Such good music. Honestly, my, I just finished writing my new book. Really? And um, it's m I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's much <lie>. better. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. You have to write that in there. Get my name. Yeah. It's um, much no, it's, it's like much better. Level. That's yeah. Isn't this funny? When I was 10 years old, do you know, I remember saying I had a lot of shame when I was obsessed with money, right? My, my S in my name is a pound sign. And I did that when I was 10. I was like, fucking Stephen with a... Like, it's ridiculous now. I should really not tell people that. But thank you so much for getting the book. It means a lot. Thanks. I just I want to say massive thank you to you. Oh, you're a sweetheart. Bless you. Bless you. Oh. You're really a surprise to me. Oh, you're such a sweet. And any time I have a bad day or anything happens, maybe at home or something, you're always the first person that I listen to on my headphones. It's just oh, thank you, man. You're really inspirational. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how much. It sounds like a really strange thing to say, but just by doing that, you've enabled me to like live my dreams. <laughs> Genuinely, like I get to have this, do this podcast thing and, and all that stuff that I just, it's just a dream I could never have had. So thank you so much. No that worries. means the world to me. And that gives me a little jolt of inspiration to not only continue doing what we're doing, but to, um, to spend more time having these conversations with people like you. Thank you. Thank can you I so much. Of course you can. <laughs> nice to meet you. What's your name? Gabrielle. Of course you can, Gabrielle. Um, yeah, my phone's like running out. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. I'm having 32 shots at the World Cup, I'm not scoring, it's like a record of 32 <laughs> shots and no goals in 2006 or whatever it was. He came back and myself and John and Ashley, we. Hello, Frank, you're Hi. right. So we've got quite a big crowd today, but they will be going. Chelsea fan. Yeah. Good to see you. Nice to see you, finally. Apologies again. Have a nice holiday? Really nice. Yeah. Really good. New York. And so we did all the Central Park, Statue of Liberty, all of that stuff. And then in the evenings we went out and did that stuff a little bit. Okay, man. That's good. It was good. We had some family with us, so we had their help. What's, what's front of mind for you at the moment? What are you thinking about when you're waking up in the morning? What's front of my mind? Yeah. Um, uh, what my next job might be. Yep. How much I should relax and enjoy. You know, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, a fight of like I want to work, but then I've got time to really appreciate the family. Mm -hmm. At the minute I'm a bit like some days I wake up and it's like I want to work. And so I should do a bit of focus on planning, even though it's hard to plan when you don't know where your next mm -hmm. job is. And then I have days like today where I know I'm doing this. So I wake up this morning, I walk the dog and I, I like to be prepped. How do you prep? 
How, how does one prep? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I'm not really that prep. So it's just, no, that's I, good. I'm, I'm like, I read a ton of st- the way that my process works is I just read a lot of stuff. Yeah, and then I have faith that I'm, cur- I'm going to be curious enough. Yeah, and it really is for me. It's like curiosity. I'm, I'm also just generally like, um, my thing is always trying to understand people. Well, um, I suppose my fear would be when I say prep, it's like loosely prepping, but I just give myself a little. I know you're probably going to run through my life. So it's like, well, when, when did that happen? And what did you think then? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. otherwise I'll probably go home tonight and go, shit, I didn't, you know, when he's talking about that, or missed that, or I thought, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. that's what I mean, prep. Some of my biggest fear is you ask me something and I go, oh, no, you know where to go with that. Yeah. But I suppose- That's part of- It's part of it, isn't yeah. it? It's, do you get nervous with these things? Um, do you know, sometimes when, uh, um, like when I interviewed Matt Hancock, Yeah. Because I knew there was a huge responsibility for me to know lots yeah. of information about politics and yeah. dates when they had Cobra meetings about the, all of that stuff. It was, it was quite, it was a little bit terrifying. Yeah, sure. And then I interviewed Jordan Peterson, who's very, very smart, and I was right. wondering if I could keep up with him intellectually. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. sleep very well the night before, but yeah. outside of that, not really. I think yeah. I've kind of learned to trust. Yeah. Just the way you do it. Yeah, yeah. In the conversation, mm. Frank. How are you doing? Really well, thank you. There's always a there's always a short and a long answer to that, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for your secondary. For that. Yeah. <laughs> what's the what's the long version of of that? Cheers, mate. Cheers. Thank you. I'll Good to see you. Yeah, please yeah. do. Cheers. Thank you. Really, really, really. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with everything. So who's staying for Rita Ora? Will I have? Anybody will I have? See you later, everybody. See you later. See you soon. Rita Ora is arriving in 30 minutes, but I have a job interview to do. So I'm going to pop into the shower over there do this job interview. I wonder if anyone's ever done a job interview in a shower before. Maybe they won't want to work here anymore if they realise that I'm conducting the job interview in a shower. I can't do it here because it's going to be quite noisy if people walk in. But the shower, the shower looks quiet. And I think the building things is is the biggest part for me. I want to be part of a business that's got big ambitions and they want to, to build. And what um, I, I always think that in our careers, we come to learn what we're good at, um, often by the things that our colleagues and team members end up giving to us to figure out and solve. What are the things that end up coming your way? The things that your colleagues typically think, oh, okay, she can, uh, she's the best person to handle this particular challenge. Well, Thank you, Anna. Nice Pleasure to meet you Thanks too. Hopefully see you Have soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was uh, an interview that I'm doing for Flight Story, which is my marketing agency. Um, the agency's grown very quickly over the last two years from zero to about 120 people all over the world. And right now, my big focus is literally hiring the best people I possibly can. When I do my interviews, I typically ask like four questions. What is it that you're good at? Um, and the way that I frame that is by trying to understand the type of work that their colleagues in the past have given to them. What is it you hate? And then I really want to know what they're, what they're into outside of work. The wonderful lady I was just speaking to then is someone I'm considering for a very top level role. Um, She's got three decades of experience in this industry. And at that stage in your career, when you're speaking to someone that's that experienced, really what their career should have become is they should have become quite a specialist, which means they they should be wearing less and less hats. Senior people, as they progress in their careers, end up... Um just focusing on the things that they're good at. And there's, in big organizations, there's lots of other people that can do all the other stuff. And it's, it's also the case with me where in my career now, I only focus on a very few things, but it's the things that only I can do. And everything else I possibly can, I delegate to whoever else is capable of doing those things better than me. And I should be surrounded by people that are just so much better than me. And the last question I ask, as I, as I mentioned there is, what they do outside of work. I think that's also always telling. I think you can pay, paint a really good picture of an individual by understanding what they choose to do when there's not when work is not in the picture. So hearing that she she does Muay Thai, she, she's been training in Muay Thai, which is incredible. So she's a fighter, she's competitive, she's disciplined. That's what I got from that. Very into health, fitness and optimization. I got a ton from that about 
her personality, someone that's really into health and fitness and sleep and glucose. They are scientific, analytical. They care about um, themselves. And I always think that, you know, respect starts with self-respect. Um, and, uh, and yeah, she's family orientated, so she'll be really good at prioritizing time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, she's been, been through three decades of a career. So she, she'll, she'll have a lot she can bring to the table. So anyway, she was great. And I hope, I hope sometime soon you see her in the office because I think she's a great candidate. So fingers crossed. Is that them there? Are they here? Okay, I'm gonna go upstairs. Right. Right, right. let's check something. Yeah. So excited. Yeah, so are we. We've been wanting to do this for so long. Amazing. Yeah, it's so exciting. What Hi. can I get you to drink? Who's this? Is this is Pablo. Pablo. He's got... Hi, Pablo. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 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 Hi.
Hello. Hi. Yo. Good to see you. Hi, Jack. No, you're not. I'm Grace. Nice to meet you. Hey, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. So, have you seen the Threads app that um, Instagram has just launched? So Instagram have launched a, well, they're launching tomorrow a version of their own Twitter, and they they sent me the access to it on Monday to play around with. So yeah. there's about a thousand people on it, and it's really good. And it's coming out globally. How long have you been doing your your, your podcast? Honestly, um, really about two and a half years now, and it went and it's just it, yeah. Okay. And how many? Yeah. How long is each episode? Uh, two two hours. Two hours. <laughs> yeah. Oh damn! Yeah. Cool. So you're gonna chop it up? Cause we were talking for like eight, right? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we were talking. For two hours. No, but that's what people expect on this. They expect long form <laughs> like content. So we, we we try not to chop it up too much. But oh, uh, cool. Yeah, that's what our audience want. So. Yeah. And wait, and so you put it out where? It goes everywhere. So it goes. On, it'll be on nine different airlines. It'll be on every. We're the only podcast to be on loads of airlines. We did that deal ourselves. So you'll be on American Airlines, British Airways. You'll see it on all the planes. British, my favorite. Can I you'll like this one. one. Prisons. Fifty. So fifty prisons in the UK have it on Intel technology. So the prisoners watch it, and then obviously YouTube, Apple, Spotify. But we care a lot about distribution. That's where we're trying to innovate. So we think about a piece of content. Where can we put it? Mm. And we've been we've broken all of those deals ourselves. Mm. So cool. We're doing. Um, we're, I'm doing a, a doc cast. Right. It's like this hybrid podcast doc. Yeah. Um, and it's about inspo. Because I think it's important to have a different conversation around AI, mm -hmm. a more optimistic one. <laughs> but as, well, as I was uh, we doing our podcast, I'm like, oh shit. Love to have you in the, uh, on the doc. 100%. Yes. Yeah. If you need anything from me, just drop me a message. I, cool. I feel like I need to reciprocate. So I appreciate you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks. No, it's just, it's an honor. I'm really, really excited. It's fun. Mm. Much of this is centered on vulnerability, right? Our and the things we struggle with. I mean, this is what this is about. Our our they had this composed. No, no, no. I watched the um, rehearsal video. Our our He's just incredible. Um, I was on his Instagram. Oh, really. No, the, the way you and I have to treat this is you and I having a conversation by ourselves. They're voyeurs. We're not performing. Mm -hmm. You know, the trick is for you and I to relax. Exactly. And if we're relaxed and just with each other, like you and I going out for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. The energy is going to be so excited in here tonight. Don was telling me today this morning, he was like, he was like whipping email like crazy of people trying to get one like spare tea. People are coming by themselves. So like, people, like I told you, I bumped into someone in a restaurant today who flew here yeah. from the Channel Islands <laughs> yeah. for this. What yeah. someone like from Australia? Yeah. Yeah, to me, the, there's no story if you can't hear that. No, no, we don't. I'm gonna stay, okay. I'll stay. I care too much about being able to hear it. It's like 70%. I'm losing, I'm losing the odd word or two, but the problem is if you lose a word or two, when it's so specifically poetic, it ruins the whole sentence. The only, the only way to bring in more words would be to eat here, so I'll go speak to you Okay. I say this because, um, the words are, add all the meaning to what I'm watching. And as like a non-dance person, it's really, that's like, need I, need, I need the stabilizers, yeah, yeah, you know? That's why we did it. Yeah, exactly. And I, it right. just, it would have, yeah. It, it would have been so good, if only. Yeah, yeah. Vulnerability is the doorway to connection. Our ego, our pride, our identity, continue to travel so I used to feel like vulnerability wasn't improving, I'd be worried, but yeah. every time I hear it, they tweet it. They just have to, it's the treble and the bass. Mm -hmm. There was a sentence which I couldn't hear at all, which was, um, um, there's a different, yeah, and the, um, th there's a difference between, I say to Simon, there's a difference between being alone and lonely, right? And you say, yeah, you say it quite gently. Yeah, yeah. and then Simon goes, yeah, that's fine. But th th he says, yeah, and he goes on to say something else. Okay. There. So I do think it's the bass. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what we're doing now, I'm going backstage. 
reflect on the last conversation we had on air and there's something that happened at the very beginning of the conversation which really changed my life in a lot of ways. I come into these conversations with usually some kind of preconceived notion about the direction of the conversation but when we sat down for that third conversation I asked you a question and it's a question that we all use flippantly every day in every facet of our lives. I asked you a question which was my first question for you. You know this question is often asked quite flippantly but I want to I'd really like the real answer which is how are you doing? But for some reason, which I would love to understand, you chose to give me the real answer. The yeah. space that I'm sitting in is I'm actually quite feeling quite lonely. Mm. And, uh, and I learned about how to manage mental fitness during COVID. And so prior, I would have been embarrassed by saying I'm feeling lonely. I would have um, hid it, suppressed it, uh, whereas now, I'm just sitting in it, not worried about it. Um, I'm allowing it to go through me, like I'm allowing myself to have a bad day at the gym. Weirdly, even though it's not necessarily fun, um, weirdly appreciative of it. I'm very grateful that you asked me to be honest, because I wouldn't have been. <laughs> I would have said, I'm fine. And the journey that you and I went on not only did it help me learn things about myself and sort of bring me out of that little darkness that I was in, but the lessons that I learned I've been able to give to other people since then. The big one was what it means to hold space for another human being. Um, so often when we are struggling, um, the number of times that people try to fix us, when you say, I'm struggling, I'm not doing well, I'm lonely, I'm unhappy, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever the feeling is, somebody wants to try and fix us. And what I learned from that conversation with you is when someone is in a dark space, it's as if they're sitting in mud. And we don't want to be pulled out of the mud. We don't want to be fixed. What we want is someone to come and sit in the mud with us. And I call it mud because the friend who comes to sit in mud with you, it's not fun sitting in mud. It's not fun sitting in mud with your friend. It's, it's a hard space to be in. But to me, that's what true friendship is, is someone who's just willing to sit in the mud with you and go, this sucks. And you go, yeah, this sucks. If any of my friends have a problem and they tell me about it instantaneously until we had this conversation, yeah. I'm trying to fix the problem because that's just the way I am. I'm very logical. I'm like, there'll be some science or psychology that will fix this that I must have been exposed to. Yep. And then you said that, and, it, and that also made sense to me. And I looked at all the conversations I've been in where in some ways I'm making it about myself when I jump into fixer mode. Yeah, I mean, it's well-intentioned yeah. to be a fixer, obviously, um, but it's, um, as you said, it's a little bit selfish, you know? It was a really nice balance of everything. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Turkey and northern Syria were rocked by two deadly earthquakes. It had a magnitude of 7.8. Buildings were reduced to rubble, with thousands lying dead beneath the debris and dust. A second earthquake, almost as powerful, then hit nine hours later, trapping many of those already involved in the initial respite.
When I first saw the imagery coming out of Turkey and Syria two months ago, I felt so, it's that sort of helpless feeling you get when you see people suffering and you feel so far away from it. And usually, I mean, this has happened several times in my life, but um, things have changed in my life now where I can have more of an active role in trying to do something about it. I'm preparing myself as well, I think emotionally, because I think we're gonna, we're gonna see devastation today. So we're gonna see some pretty horrific things. And I know that there are still people trapped underneath the rubble. Um, there are people that have lost family members um, that still haven't found their family members. I think I, I, I sometimes describe these things as unimaginable. Well, today I'm gonna to be able to imagine them, so. Okay, so we are in an area called Hatay, where pretty much all of the buildings have been destroyed. And obviously the issue you have when, when every building is either dangerous, can't be um, lived in or has fallen down, is you need to house the people somewhere. So what they've created here in Hatay is these tent cities. So currently we have a, a family, uh, like almost everyone died except the baby. So the, the grandmother is, is the one who's taking care of the baby. So. But she has not only lost Fabia, uh, Rabia's parents, she has also lost all of her kids. So the Rabia is the only one left. And now the grandmother has taken, chosen to take care of that small baby. And she showed me on her phone the father, the mother, and the other siblings that were killed in the early hours of the morning when the earthquake struck. We, we lost everything, our kids, our houses, our jobs, our cars, everything that you can imagine. The weather is making the situation even more dangerous for those still trapped. Rain, sleet and snow are slowing down the schools. The temperatures are expected to drop below zero in the coming hours. struggled over the last couple of days to really put into words how I feel. One of the most important things I learned on the trip is that even though when the news cycles end, right, even though we don't see Turkey on the news anymore, the devastation and the impact continues for years and years and years and for some people that I met will continue for the rest of their lives. Their, their lives will never ever be the same again. And I'll tell you one of the most moving things for me which shifted my perspective hugely, was when I met that dad in that concrete, that small two metre, three metre by three metre concrete hut. Small hut where he had his entire family, beautiful family. And I asked him the question, what are your goals for the future? And he said to me, safety. Safety, safety. If I asked you, listening to this now, what are your goals for the future? Imagine what percentage might respond safety. When I came to learn that the refugees are being given these little cash cards by the British Red Cross, which are basically like debit cards. They can use the money put onto those debit cards to buy whatever they want, which I think is a really, really dignified way to help them. When you donate to charity, sometimes you think that you don't know where your money goes. So to realize that some of the money is going directly from my bank account to the debit card of someone that needs it and their family in the wake of an earthquake or natural disaster or war who desperately needs it for them to spend the money how they need to on their family on sanitary products or food or whatever it might be, I think is a, an incredible idea. And seeing this and learning about it has inspired a new idea. What if we put up a landing page and started a new initiative with the British Red Cross called like cash cards or Red Cross cash cards or red cards or whatever it is, where people could donate with the knowledge that 100% of their donation is going directly into the pockets of people around the world 
in the wake of these natural disasters that need it the most. I told the British Red Cross about this idea that we have started work on it, which puts a big smile on my face because I leave Turkey with this sense of like privileged responsibility, like understanding the absolute privilege of my life and this responsibility to do something about what I've seen, but also to do something about my privilege. So I have a meeting booked with the British Red Cross next week. I'm gonna bring you along with it and I'm gonna take you along on this whole journey to launching this project and initiative called the cash card or whatever it will be called. If, ladies and gentlemen, you have enjoyed this vlog, there's only one thing I'll ask you as a favor, and I'm sure most of you have already done it, but for the odd one or two people that haven't done it, the only favor I'll ask you, I promise, is to hit that subscribe button. And if you hit that subscribe button, then I promise next Sunday at this time, I'll upload part four of Behind the Diary. Thank you so much for being here. And if you've gotten to the end, thank you especially. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I love you lots. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.